wanted to build on the excellent presentations of the Minister, Marie and Finton, and bring some of the technology industry's optimism about the future. Alan Kay, who's a Disney fellow, he once said, the best way to predict the future is to invent it. And I actually think during the Irish presidency, we actually have the opportunity uh, to invent uh, a new future for Ireland and Europe. One of my favourite quotes, uh, when the winds of change come, some people build walls, others build windmills. Uh, I think actually during our, the Irish presidency, let's go build some windmills. There's three mega trends I think we can actually surf and leverage. The first is digital transformations. I'll start with talking about that. Sustainability is a new paradigm. And lastly, mass collaboration. And particularly when we think about the concept of shared value, and we leverage the paradigm and the methodologies of open innovation, I think we can really exploit these. So let's talk first about digital transformations. Gordon Moore, one of Intel founders in 1965, wrote a very nice paper called, you know, talking about actually cramming more transistors onto integrated circuits. It's become known as uh, Moore's Law, and I've been very lucky to, to meet Gordon a couple of times, very humble person, but little did he know how profound uh, his prediction would be, and uh, Moore's Law actually isn't a law, it's actually a competitive challenge. And our industry, Intel, with our competitors, with our suppliers, we make this happen year in, year out. We double the transistor density every 18 months or so, and we deliver that at lesser equal cost. Now that's interesting, we, we, we saw very significant uh, challenges, but the business and societal consequence of this is we have a resource that is doubling in capability and dropping in cost year after year, and that creates a tremendous opportunity. So each year, there are more things that we can do that we weren't able to even envisage two or three years ago. Um, the beauty of Moore's Law, uh, some will be familiar with E.F. Schumacher's writing around small is beautiful. The smaller we get, the faster we go, and the more energy efficient, and that's very relevant. I think the big sort of aha point is we see Moore's Law colliding with virtually every domain, whether it's genomics research, whether it's oil exploration, whether it's automotive, there's opportunity for disruption. And three years ago when we established Intel Labs Europe, we put, put forward a vision of a digital Europe, uh, how we could create Moore's Law in each of the individual verticals in Europe and drive transformation, have a connected society and a, a much stronger economy. One example might be in healthcare. This is one of the grand challenges. What we've been trying to do is articulate a vision where we can find technology interventions that not only reduce the cost of care, but improve the quality of life. What if everybody in the healthcare industry got behind this vision and this became the Moore's Law? We could, get, we could transform much quicker. If this was a technology talk, I could talk to you about the, co the coming revolution because we haven't seen anything yet. Some of you might be familiar with Ray Kurzweil. He talks about the law of accelerating returns with we'll see more change in the next 10 years we've seen in the last 100. We're just coming out of the evolution of the internet, embedded systems. We're about to move into the era of the cyber physical systems, but that's another talk. Let's talk about sustainability. I think we'd all acknowledge we're probably moving from the era of resource-based society to a knowledge-based society. But the curious thing is, as we make this change, actually resource consumption continues to go up. When we talk about sustainable development, what do we mean? Well, people, I think the Brundtland report is probably the best source um, here. It talks about a pattern of usage where we can meet, of resource usage, we can meet the needs of today while also allowing future generations to, to meet their needs. How are we doing? Well, not too good. Today we use about 1.4 Earth's worth of resources to sustain our needs. If we keep going, we'll actually need two Earths by 2050. Beautiful quote from the former Prime Minister of Costa Rica, Jose, Jose Maria Frigueres, there is no planet B. So we need to do something different. <laughs> the answer is resource decoupling. So how can we improve quality of life? How can we grow GDP while actually decoupling resource usage from that and actually bending the curve of environmental degradation? Well, fortunately, Moore's Law actually is one of the few modern-day business ph phenomena, or societal phenomena, that actually play into this. This is a chart produced by ACEEE in the US. It looks at the energy efficiency of different verticals over the last 30 years. Uh, at a cursory reading, is actually quite good. Automotive, 40% energy efficiency in the last 30 years. BMW have probably done better. Philips have driven a, just a remarkable change in lighting, more than 300% energy efficiency in 30 years. But look at the number of computer systems, 2.8 million percent energy efficiency improvement over 30 years. So what's the opportunity? It's resource decoupling. We leverage this just enormous um, you know, order, orders of magnitude, better performance to actually 
replace resources that we use in other industries using information technology. And we know how to do this. We've been doing it for the last couple of decades through automation, through substitution, through dematerialization, online, ba online banking, e-books, digital music. We know how to do it. We just need to go faster. And lastly, mass collaboration. Uh, I think we're fortunate in Europe to actually have the European Internet Foundation. It's a collection of forward-looking MEPs. I had the honor of hosting them in our headquarters in Santa Clara about two, two months ago. And two years ago, they published an outstanding report, um, The Digital World in 2025. They identified a lot of the trends that we, we all see, but the single central paradigm that they called out is mass collaboration. And I think we see already sort of some you know, superficially levels of this happening with, with Facebook and YouTube and Twitter. Uh, but much more fundamental changes are going to come from, from mass collaboration. We'll have a lot, lot more person-to-person -person collaboration, person-to-machine, and probably even more compelling will be the machine-to-machine -machine collaboration. Mm -hmm. Our projection as a company will see 15 billion connected devices by 2050, so just in three years. Ericsson think it's about 50 billion, so big changes are coming. Associated with that, innovation is changing. In the past, it was a brilliant research scientist at IBM or Bell Labs or Intel that made the change. The last decade, we've seen the era of open innovation, and that was conceptualized by Henry Chesbro in a, a book he published in 2003. But now we're in the era of innovation networks where it's not how good your company is, or indeed how your country is, but how good your ecosystem is. And the best example of this is in the phone business. It's iPhone versus Android and Samsung versus Nokia Microsoft. I'm very pleased to say that Intel, if we were giving this talk in a year's time, uh, we've just launched a whole new set of phones, and hopefully will be the fourth competing ecosystem in this, this area. Uh, in Europe, our research labs, we've quadrupled the number of R&D labs that Intel has in Europe. I'm very pleased to say that the next moonshot for the computing industry and for Intel, which is to build an exascale computer, it's the 80% of the work is actually happening in Europe. Two years ago, that wouldn't have been unconscionable. It would have been happening in, in, in the US. So today, Intel has 40 labs. We have 4,000 R&D professionals, and we have 400 collaborators. But the strength is really in the ecosystem. Using open innovation ecosystems, we can move much faster. We achieve higher quality work, and we do it for less cost. I want to talk about vision for a second. <coughs> this isn't a talk about Intel, but it's a talk about visions. Intel has a vision that this decade will create and extend computing technology. You might expect that from us. But we'd like to connect and enrich the lives of everybody on the planet. And that's a very sincerely held view that we not only have an opportunity, but we also have a responsibility. Michael Porter has written about this in the last couple of years, the principle of shared value. Can we reconceive the intersection between corporate performance and society? We think we can. C.K. Prahalad wrote about this, the fortune at the bottom of the pyramid, how we could actually use technology to solve problems in the third world, bring their quality of life to the first world, and be profitable at the same time. Indeed, for the organization I lead, Intel Labs Europe, we've very seriously aligned our research agenda, our mission, actually with the, the whole grander EU project. So we're partnering with the European ecosystem, and we hope to play our part in enabling Europe 2020. Lisbon's strategy was a beautiful strategy. I'm reminded of what Winston Churchill said. No matter how beautiful the strategy, you occasionally need to look at the results. And there were no results. But this time, I think, actually, if we work together, we actually can achieve Europe 2020. And we've aligned our research agenda and our innovation agenda against five of the flagship initiatives of, the European, of Europe 2020. The last thing I want to talk about is innovating innovation. Henry Chesbrough conceptualized in 2003 the phenomenon of open innovation, and Procter & Gamble, with their connect and develop strategy, are probably the leading exemplars of that. And today, almost 50% of the new products that Procter & Gamble bring to the market actually originate from ideas that came from outside uh, the company. Probably the biggest change, though, that's happening is the concept of triple helix innovation, which is a, is a philosophy that's been espoused by Professor Henry Ektovitz, who was at Newcastle in the UK for many years and uh, was largely unnoticed, and he moved to Stanford, and now this is the hottest thing in, in the innovation field, so there, there, there's a lesson there. But there's a very simple idea here that by working together, industry, academia, and government working together, we can drive structural changes far beyond the scope of what any one organization can do. And I think during the Irish presidency, we, we can really leverage this principle. In fact, there's a whole new field, and, and you know, if we, we had more time, I could talk to you about what we think are the 10 defining characteristics of Open Innovation 2.0. Some examples in, in London, we're working with the City of London, with UCL and Imperial, we've created a new institute 
uh, that's about actually changing or creating a future city and we've had tremendous support from the UK government in particular from the, from the Chancellor we launched this initiative at Downing Street a couple of months ago. We're doing the same in, in Dublin and today in Dublin we have installed ambient intelligence systems actually you're know, very close to here that are working with a city watch application that's going to enable you know collaboration coming back to mass collaboration citizens to interact directly actually uh, uh, with uh, city management we think there's a blueprint for actually creating a sustainable society an opportunity for ireland during the presidency to leverage some of the some of the things that finton shared uh, we um, think there's a way of actually creating what might be termed the value cycle. Um, in, in, over the last, um, I guess, 20, 30 years, Porter's value chain actually got a lot of um, sort of coverage in business schools. And you know, if you were in business, you had to identify what was your value chain. Well, the value chain was very much associated about actually taking a resource, using it up, and throwing it away. And it was somebody else's problem to, to actually deal with that. I think there's a great new concept, which is about a value cycle, where you can actually repen replenish renewable resources you know, quicker than you're actually using them. And this actually creates you know, a virtuous circle. So what we are hoping to do uh, in association with companies or with organizations like AirGrid, like Glenn Dimplex, like Mainstream Renewable Technologies, like ESB, like Daimler, next year during the Irish presidency to actually show, showcase this at work. Renewable energies, you know, routinely AirGrid are getting close to 50% um, of our Ireland's getting close to our, our, our uh, fifty percent of our, our needs uh, from wind, energy storage probably has been the most difficult problem to solve. We have some very very promising technologies in Intel Labs uh, to solve this problem, but it's probably three, four, five years away from production. Glenn Dimplex, Irish company, very successful. They've come up with a very nice solution that is going to be trialled very shortly. Um, in in uh, in Dublin, Marie identified buildings as a huge source of. Um, you know, c consumption, we think there's a, a, a huge opportunity actually to transform the way uh, buildings operate and, and turn them into to, to energy positive infrastructure. I should mention we've got inspiration from um, Rifkin who wrote an excellent book around the third industrial revolution and uh, we've tried to actually pull that in and you know, Rifkin talks about the hydrogen economy and hydrogen storage. What we're trying to do is actually extend his vision and actually demonstrate something that works uh, next year in Dublin. Personal energy, we're currently trialing a number of interesting technologies in our employees' homes. Next week, we start a trial in Roebuck Downs around a platform we call NLive, Energy Live, which is around electric vehicle charging. It's around home energy management. It will also predict you know, the routes that you're going to take you know, and how much charge we'll negotiate in real time uh, with the utilities to get you the most um, advantageous pricing, but also to smooth the demand across the nation. We had a very nice result. We have a, a joint collab with SAP in Belfast. This is another example of triple helix innovation. SAP provide the back ends for most of the utilities. But purely by doing smart charging, we could introduce a quarter of a million electric vehicles onto the island of Ireland without any increase in supply capacity. I think that's a, that's a great opportunity. The smart grid, of course, is uh, everybody's talking about it. It's very easy to talk about. It's incredibly difficult to deliver because what we have to do is actually create the internet. We, we have to bring the electricity grid and the, the internet together to do something that nobody's ever done before. Incredibly complex, so it's easy for us to talk about it. Uh, how we're going to deliver it, we're not sure, but I think we, we, could, we can actually test this and uh, you know, perhaps make it work here in Ireland. And lastly, <coughs> sustainable mobility. All of the automotive companies are thinking about the model they had in the past, which was to maximize the number of cars they could sell, which is not very um, uh, sustainable. How can they mass, um, maximize the longevity of the assets, and how can they you know, maximize the utilization of those assets? So we, we also hope to be working with some of the, um, the more forward-thinking automotive companies in terms of demonstrating sustainable mobility. And the idea is that we can create this virtuous circle. We can improve energy efficiency. We can improve energy self-sufficiency. And we. I think demonstrated the benefit of that, and Joyce, I'll finish in a second. We can add in, we can actually create new services, and we're already witnessing new services that are coming from big data, and we absolutely think there's an opportunity to, to, to grow jobs, and I think um, Marie's uh, data um, substantiated that. Wanted to finish, big things happen when you have a vision. Alexander Graham Bell, of course, John F. Kennedy. These are the visions. Nikola Tesla had a vision you know, more than a century ago about a sustainable society. <laughs> Your many generations pass, our machinery will be driven by a power obtainable at any point in the universe. 
If he were here today, he'd be very disappointed with the progress we've made, but I think he'd be quite optimistic with what can be achieved. So what might be a possible vision for our presidency? Well, what about Ireland as a leading exemplar of a sustainable society to catalyze Europe? And our image would go from this to this. <laughs> And my, my last point is, so I think it's possible we actually have, by osmosis, all of these partners lining up together to do this, but it's going to take one thing, it's courage. So Felix Baumgartner, I think, actually inspired us all, and this isn't him standing, this is actually the moment when he jumped, so it's not talking about the hard decisions and moving forward, it's actually doing it. My favourite tweet associated with this uh, was actually from an American who tweeted about 10 minutes after he landed, he said, uh, I just realised that an energy drink company has a better space program than my country. <laughs> so I think the opportunity is for Ireland, we're never going to have the best space program on the planet, but we might have the best space heating program on the planet. Uh, we'd like to demonstrate this at a conference called Mission Sustainable Growth, which will take place in, in May here in association with several of the DGs. And I look forward actually at that conference uh, to actually demonstrating you know, what we and Fintan and Marie and the minister have been talking about. So thank you for your attention.